start the recording here. <laughs> so the, I, I crop out the start sometimes for the YouTube stuff. So just do cloth constraints, configure cloth. And then I should be able to, maybe instead of guide deform, you would want to do um, just a point deform. The guide deform is more for wires or individual curves. Favorite pick between cloth, pyro, RBD, flip, and so on? I think pyro and smoke effects is my favorite. I get volumetrics. Um, one of my favorite things to work on. I mean, you kind of use it. You can use pyro and like layer it on with a lot of stuff, but purely pyro is a pretty fun area. It's like pretty quick feedback and stuff to work on it. Like RBD can get quite slow and tedious dealing with all the constraints and, and technical um, data and stuff underneath. And then um, sometimes flip, it will just take a long time to mesh everything and then render it like refractive and, and visualize it like it, it becomes a lot slower to work on that kind of stuff. But so I, I, I enjoy the variation of everything switching between it. So the one thing we were doing with this air constraints here is pinning the root points to um, that's basically like your glue that you were talking about, uh, Umer. Um, so you just do pin points here. Um, could see if this works. I'm not sure, but I think we could do like at p dot y maybe is less than one. So there's a few different ways that it would create the constraints or the uh, glue. I'm just gonna visualize this here. Maybe open the spreadsheet. So sometimes you'd see under the type, that's where I'm looking is just for a pin. The other place it would be would just be a point attribute. Um, yeah, so I think it's like over here, if I look at the spreadsheet for this glue to animation, it will just set a, the, the group or whatever to, uh, one or true. Um, so it should do the same thing over here for, for this cloth, but it looks like it's possible that this group, you can't set it um, using these, like, uh, this is kind of like a virtual group. Like it doesn't, it, it needs to be an actual group on the geometry, I think with this, because it's a, a digital asset. Um, so I'm just gonna create this base group first with points. And then you can see it's highlighting the bottom um, I could just call this glue or pin or whatever like that. And then go into my cloth, select the group, um, match animation, I believe. Match animation. So with the hair or wires, it has this orientation, but for cloth, it doesn't uh, have it because it's already like a connected geometry. And should be good to switch this stuff over. Um, to just get rid of this stuff to make it a little bit more clear. So this is a bit hard to see right now, but like this area here is glued to the, to the thing that's twisting. Um, one thing I could do maybe is another, let me uh, adjust some of this stuff. So with the bend stiffness, I'm gonna increase that quite a bit. So we get something that's like 
um, can kind of stand up a little bit. So maybe like a harder, stiffer plastic or something like that that doesn't uh, bend over as easily. Quick question, can we const create constraints in SOP and control them in DOP as well as we does RBD? Or does it work fundamentally different in Vellum? Uh, they're moving those two things to be more like a unified workflow, I would say, or working similarly. Um, you can... So all of these Vellum nodes are creating like this pink output is all, always going to generate constraints. Um, let me just visualize some of this stuff. So maybe I'm going to increase this group uh, range right here to like grouping more of the base of this clock. So now you can see it's glued, sticking to the to the stuff a little bit better. Flash ATO, <laughs> the boss is back in the office. So maybe I might just uh, increase the resolution. So it's kind of glued. Maybe we didn't need too much. Just decrease that uh, glue distance. So I'm kind of thinking of this as like the glue distance. So that's how I would say is like the easiest way to um, stick freely flying cloth to a certain object. Um, and if you want it to collide with that, you can just input the animation into the last input here of the vellum solver. So now that if this was like a character's skin or uh, a rug, or I don't know what it would be, we were doing the kind of a brush setup um, last week when I was doing this with the curves. But again, the same idea can be uh, applied for different vellum stuff. And then even this underlying technique with, um, uh, where is it? The, let me pause this animation. So we just go up to the pin. Um, the, the attributes that this sets, glue to animation is the same idea. I didn't set the exact same animations because I think I was doing stopped. But working this way with um, stopped is the same way that I was setting up with the grains, vellum grains YouTube tutorial for the sand grains. Um, so with the, all the different vellum types of uh, materials or geometry, particles, curves, and surfaces, you kind of can follow a bit of the same steps to, to get them working. So yeah, maybe, um, maybe doing another twist type of thing another bend. With Houdini and its massive workflow, as junior artists sometimes it feels very overwhelming. How do you pass that stage? Yeah. <laughs> Just enough time, I think. Um, maybe I'll do this one underneath. Uh, yeah, just enough time, I think. And the main thing is just not to get overwhelmed. Like, even with these streams, I've been trying not to get too wild with it. Like, narrowing in on vellum right now for a couple of weeks and just focusing on that area um it's with the, all the different because you were saying it is massive like it is easy to get overwhelmed and trying out different areas of it so quickly and just kind of like you you become disorganized you don't learn as much or, or i don't know so i'll just focus um certain areas of houdini like if you're just learning it maybe just sticking to sops um, so these, these solvers are a bit nicer cause you don't have to know as much of like, so if I go inside of here, the, the actual dot network setup is a bit hidden or off limits to me. 
So just sticking in the geometry uh, context, if you're just starting out and focusing on that um, is like, I don't know. That's my recommendation is just breaking Houdini into the smaller networks or the smaller areas. Um, so just worrying about the geometry context. V, 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 V is for Velen. Um, but yeah, and then breaking up the things you're trying to learn into smaller goals, like spending a week learning how to make like a procedural tree or something like that, that's like kind of quantifiable tasks or things like goals that you can hit instead of just, it's easy to, to look at Houdini in its entirety and think like, uh, I'm going to spend one year to learn all of Houdini, but then like breaking it up into subtasks or smaller goals that you can more easily like it just becomes a more achievable kind of uh thing and less daunting i guess overall vegan nuts how's it going valentino laz thank you for the twitch prime start easy make a tree <laughs> so i mean i don't know like it depends how you're making the tree but there's the l system stuff um so this will kind of come with like a, a bit of a tree um, and you can even do animate like generations to control animations. So like if you were very close to beginner level, this they do have some randomness you can add in. Um, but then just doing like copy sop to make branches or trees. Yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> just trying to kind of just got hung up on this, but that's the overall is uh, my approach is uh, breaking it up into smaller tasks. So yeah, I'll add an additional bend here. Um, ooh, look at that. Pretty cool. Whoop. <laughs> so I think I should be able to do um, capture origin. All right. Haven't been able to catch the live lately. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're all, I think everyone's a bit busy or I don't know, some people are starting back at school or get projects are picking up for them and stuff like that. But it's like a snap bracelet. It's a bit like that, yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're all back. Good to have a pretty lively uh, crew today. So yeah, we'll do, um, could probably keep going with this sine wave. We have the function here, sign, creating this like signal. Um, to this was like rocking things back and forth, and I'll just copy this and do a similar thing for for that. Maybe this one we don't want it um, as frequent. So if we make the frequency of this sine wave half as much. And you can see we have like a little bit more complexity to the motion. So it's like two, two signals running at different frequencies. And then maybe this, uh, I don't know, could be a bit too much, but we'll see. So now we put everything together. We have this might go and we don't need as much stiffness. It's like a bit too much of a metal or something. I don't know, aluminum or something like that. RIP my Thursday morning classes. <laughs> now that you discovered the cool zone. A new song? I don't know. I, I haven't added new songs recently, but the folder I'm pulling from is like seven or eight hours or something like that. So it's possible some stuff wasn't um, heard before. Naranjos, 
we're doing more vellum stuff. Um, Umer was asking about like gluing cloth to objects. So I'm kind of doing a bit of that right now. Um, gluing it to this animated like uh, panel or uh, quad or whatever, the strip. And then gonna be doing a bit of balloons um, in, a, in a bit. 10 or 20 minutes maybe, get into some balloons. Um, so the, the balloons use a new constraint, or at least in the sense of these streams, we haven't talked about it yet, but there's the um, weld constraints that can break. David Blaine, <laughs> you saw him floating. He was the one that was floating in the, in the canyon or whatever recently. So maybe this is still a bit too... Um, I think I was just setting it <clears throat> to be too too high because I had a lower resolution grid before. So this is a bit closer to like a glued sheet or attached sheet or something like that. Inspired by Houdini. Pulling tricks out like Houdini. So yeah, this is a pretty uh, pretty efficient, interesting way to work. Um, I'm not making anything uh, particular right now. Umer was just asking about gluing cloth to animated geometry and having it collide with it. So I was retooling the brush setup. It was um, like we had a mop or just a bunch of strands attached to the strip. So I'm just moving it to that. My hat, did I ever have a hat? Like a top hat? Oh, his hat. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, this is a cool way to do it. And then if we wanted to get back, um, Trying to think of the best way to do this. <laughs> the hat disappeared. So yeah, I'm gonna do um, maybe this. All right, I'm just gonna go up one level and do a mocap biped. I'm going to turn off the in-place animation so he'll actually move. Um, I don't know, maybe this zombie. I guess the mocap biped one, they don't travel as far. Sometimes the three, these guys, uh, this animation lasts a bit longer. Which took, to, took some time to realize the lag. Uh, sometimes if people are experiencing lag, um, oh, just in the chat. Yeah, I'm not sure, it might be a Chatterino thing. Um, if the stream is lagging, sometimes you can just refresh your Twitch interface and you'll, you'll be a little bit closer to, to real time. Um, so yeah, what I did with that character, just to get some animation in, and then I can pull pull in the animation. Um, I don't think I want that one, just the skin. So this is gonna be the character. I think I can just scatter maybe like 10 points to him. And uh, just turn off the relax. I'm gonna do copy the points with the grid. The feather, oh, the stream before the feather. The, uh, 
cool zone. It was a bit of a failure of a cool zone. I felt felt a bit uh, bad about it. I'll I'll see if I I think I have it still on on my hard drive somewhere. So I'm just making some of these strips that are aligned to the character. Let's see what happens. So I've done this, uh, I think, before, but like one of the things you can do, you make a group on the base geometry. So this is going to be, we'll just maybe call it stuck in this case. And then you can do the group transfer. So this is a somewhat new node, but it's pretty useful. Um, so just by based off of proximity, we can transfer any group. We'll just do stuck in this case. Um, I think if I press the nine button, should show up. Looks like this is transferring other groups as well. Maybe I need to be in points, points mode for it to show up. All right. So now you can see the, the visualization. Basically, we can transfer this group kind of like you would an attribute. And then that area will be pinned or travel with glued to the, the zombie. Um, yeah, and then we're probably still going to want to do the point deform. So just take the mesh that we want to deform. Um, if I just do a time shift here, we'll get the rest like a static held frame. Just gonna go out of points mode. Just gets a bit like distracting in the viewport. Um, so this is the rest point lattice. Probably want to do the grouping based off of the rest, so that it's not changing the the group membership over time. Um, and probably the scatter as well. So all of this stuff we don't want it to be time dependent. You'd see it got, got rid of the little clock symbol. And then we'll just parent or uh, deform it. It looks a bit weird because it's like stretching some of the areas. But it should be okay because we, we're we only like updating that in the context of um, the pinned points. So you could just update this from glue. Just did a di different group name for the pin points. And um, we should be able to just get the solver as well. And then I think I'd, I'll probably want to decrease the bend, just something a little bit closer to cloth. Let's see what happens. There's some bit of like stretching or things stuck together. I turn off some of the visualization as well. But yeah, we have a, a bit of a mummy toilet paper zombie coming, <laughs> coming for you. So maybe for this context or this situation, turn on a ground plane. Um, I don't need this many sub steps at the start, I guess. Yeah, and then if we want the character as well um, acting as a collider, just add him into the collision input. And then there it is, glued. There's a bit of these intersections, like you might want to do some SAP procedures to the D intersect, um, they do have the, <laughs> what a quick lesson. 
yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, pretty simple the way that they've, they've made things with this like SOP implementation of these solvers. Like traditionally with DOP networks, it would take a lot more time because you have to build like a lot of the stuff from scratch, but this having this pre-built is super useful. Um, but yeah, so like the detangle, um, by default, the previous position field of this is, is empty. Uh, if you just put in, that's what causes it to air, air out. If you middle mouse button, you can see it says no previous position attribute specified. Um, if you just type in P, then it will basically use like itself. Um, think I don't know so the, sometimes you can do in a for each loop or something like that um, you could basically like mask out other geometries to only run it an individual strip at a time um, could try to set that up real quickly so you just do like for each connected piece this connectivity will analyze like 3D connectivity. So each island or each 3D strip will be run in its own iteration of this for each loop. Um, this connectivity node makes a primitive attribute that's the class. So each one is getting its own integer number assigned to it. Um, I think what we can do, I'm just gonna hold down Alt and drag um, this first one, uh, the begin node. And instead of having this set to for each, I'm just gonna set it to fetch the input. So right now we have this one that's getting the individual strip iteration that it's running over and then in this one is everything so if i do a primitive wrangle um what i can do is find the class of the current strip or the current iteration that it's looking at um Maybe I don't even need a wrangle. I think I could just do a blast maybe. So with this one, I can say if the class is equal to, then you do like a backtick here to get a, use a hscript expression. Um, we'll just do prim. Um, I'm gonna do negative one to use like the spare input. So you can do negative one and then you do uh, spare input. And then instead of having like to type out a reference path, you can just directly, um, just gonna do a null node right here and uh, drag it over in, into this spare input. So this negative one is just a shortcut. You could do the same thing um, and replace it with that or negative one is just shortcut for saying, use this spare input. Um, the primitive number is just gonna be zero. So this will, all of the um, class numbers, they're all gonna be the same because this is isolated a single strip. Tomorrow's showdown. <laughs> yeah, I talked about that. So if the other people joined, um, doing the Houdini battle tomorrow at six. Put a, another link to it in the chat. Um, another showdown, some heavy hitters. It's gonna be six, I believe it's 6.30 Pacific time tomorrow evening. Gonna have to amp myself up for it. Um, and then the next argument here is the attribute we want to retrieve, like the primitive attribute. So it will be class. 
And then the last one is the index. Like uh, if you have a vector value, it would be like RGB, zero, one, two, three for the component. Um, this is just a single dimension. So it's just always gonna be zero. Like, let me go back to the spreadsheet. So if this, you had like a vector attribute, like X, Y, Z, then the zero, one, two would be corresponding to X, Y, Z. But because it's always just a single thing, it's just the way that H script works or whatever. Um, so yeah, what this is doing, it's a bit long winded to set up, but basically we, here we have the current iteration strip. And then this one is isolating everything but that iteration. So we'll just say current strip. And this is everything except the current strip. So now if we do a detangle, um, instead of having it do self collisions, then we can plug in the everything else. So now we're just detangling or trying to de-intersect the other uh, geometry. So this looks a bit weird. Um, you might be able to play with like the thickness to get better results. Um, looks like it's just having a bit of issues with things that are going like right through each other. Trying to think of maybe some other things you could do. It's possible if you just start with lines. Like the, the individual lines can de-intersect each other a bit better. Um, and then at the end, if you did like a poly extrude and make the lines into sheets, it's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see how well it works. Um, but yeah, this, this one, I don't know if this is the ideal direction. It's possible if you do extrude, transform extruded front, you can work in the local space. Um, and then that just gives you options of like which direction. So this local space here is constructed with curves based off of the tangent, by tangent and normal. Uh, X, Y, and Z would correspond to those. maybe divisions is setting like the thickness or the uh, not really the thickness but just the number of uh the resolution of the extrusion um so yeah those are we'll call them de-intersected um maybe we want to do more maybe these lines aren't as long And uh, we want to do this before we transfer the group. So let's see. Works a little bit better. It's, uh, we got rid of some of that stretching or the tearing or whatever that you saw at the start of the, um, with the bigger sheets. Um, we might, maybe with these scatter points, if you do an attribute randomize, um, right now these lines, they're all like aligned. I think they're trying to align like along the surface normals or something like that with him. 
Um, but if we switch this to, um, instead of a random color, a random N or normal direction, and then instead of uniform, you can see everything with uniform is biased in a particular direction. If you change that to direction or orientation, then you'll get like uniformly 360 degrees uh, random directions. Let's see how, how hard we can push it. 270. Maybe it's a bit, it's a bit too slow. But we could always, um, go lower with the, uh, resolution of some of this stuff. I think my bending is still a bit too strong. Yeah, so now it's a bit closer to real time. We have our mummy, or, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Mr. Fettuccine Alfredo. Yeah, with Marvelous, it's pretty fast. It's just round trip to another software. I haven't tried Marvelous that much because it's, I, th I don't think that it works on Linux, but um, from what I've seen, the the uh, the performance of Marvelous and the results, like it's really high quality. I've been pretty impressed with it. But yeah, just like Houdini, the procedural nature, being able to do the group transfer to stick things uh, in that method, like that's why I'm always still stuck in Houdini is because of that um, flexibility that you have with working with other data sources, other geometry, all unified in one software. Um, but yeah, there's definitely like, in terms of individual plugins, uh, Marvelous was pretty promising. The um, Ember Gen, the Pyro, or the Fluid Solver for GPU, that gives you like pretty quick results. But then it just becomes a question of like whether you want to jump in and out of different packages and export import files and stuff is can be a bit cumbersome. Yeah, I've seen if you search on Vimeo or YouTube or I don't know, wherever, whatever media site you're you're using, uh, if you search for Embergen, um, you'll see some pretty impressive results. So yeah, this here it is, the glue, glue to character and collide setup is pretty cool. So just move this into a new folder, back up the file. Not sure if Charmin is gonna like the ad campaign. This could be a get ready for a Halloween costume if you're making your like zombie invisible man or something. He has some, some strips glued. Some, uh, what is it? There's the one character from the Adams Family, the thing, or is, is that it? It, cousin it, right? Cousin, yeah, there he is. <laughs> but yeah, you can make uh, cousins with the. <laughs> with the vellum solver. Cousins, uncles, sons, nephews. So uh, we'll put this in uh, ZZ Top. Um, just make a new folder. September 2nd. So this will do uh, vellum glue to anim. Uh, 
the music video the major laser yeah yeah we were talking about that um a few days ago i think um just how the how everyone started doing this technique and like where it came from or whatever but um yeah it was method animation that method studios that did the that project yeah so they they were one of the ones um we were also talking about the universal everything like characters um so they did a bunch of walking ones like this um i don't know when it was used for fmx yeah method did um they applied the same technique for like an intro to one of the talks or something like that I don't know, these search terms are a bit too generic. A AICP. Um, yeah, they were doing a similar technique or whatever. Yeah, and then that led the whole wave of <laughs> instant people on Instagram doing uh, wires or soft bodies attached to motion capture animation or whatever. Blatantly inspired by method studios but yeah so it's, it's a fun technique it's a really cool way to um build like a portfolio or build a, a nice set of works if you're just getting started with houdini like you already have something pretty cool to to work off of and then you're just applying different sop networks different procedures or different uh workflows to the same base starting thing or whatever you get a lot of cool demos so yeah we'll start talking about the balloon Yeah, I think it was like 2016 when that the major laser video came out. It was pretty uh pretty impressive especially for the time like I think Vellum wasn't at all in Houdini. They had their older cloth solver that was a bit slower. Um some of it might have just been like custom stuff. You could always some people like before Vellum people were just using the grain solver with the grains constrained together to kind of um give you a cloth effect like you could get a, a fast soft body sheet with with grains uh, and some people were doing that so yeah this is going to be our shape maybe kind of balloon type thing we'll just move it above the ground um we'll do another cloth configure balloon to do that I think this just gives you the cloth and pressure at once. Deflate for a tire, like uh, a flat tire. So we'll do the vellum solver. Yeah, some people have done the tire like ripping up and getting uh, torn. That's a, that's a cool idea. So this pressure gives you the, whoops. Let's go ground plane. Um, the pressure gives you this internal response. So it's like more of a soft body or whatever. Um, like without it, you just have it's not filled with anything or, or whatever. Not a flat tire, just compress a bit. I might, I don't know if I would do that with vellum. Uh, I would probably just try to do, yeah, it would be a bit overkill to do a sim for it. I would try to do it with just sop, like deformers. Yeah, or rigging techniques. Um. So yeah, that's what this pressure is doing, is just providing 
the internal uh, resistance, kind of. I think you increase rest length scale and you could get it. This is kind of like how much air is uh, pumped inside of it or whatever. Um, but yeah, and then they have the weld points. So this will look like for neighboring pieces pretty much. Um, I think the easiest way to set it up is if you just start with a clip node. Um, just go along a different axis here. And then instead of keeping just the primitives above the clipping plane or on one side of the clipping plane, um, just move it to keep everything. You can see it's still making the slice or the cut. Um, this is just the start of a balloon setup. So we're setting up some weld constraints. We're basically pre-fracturing the balloon before uh, setting it up. So I think if you just do even the assemble, um, it's egg, <laughs> fancy egg, and randomize. So this assemble, you usually use it with RBDs. Um, I'm just gonna use it here. It looks like maybe it's, I need to switch this one. So it looks like this assemble is still thinking it's, these pieces are connected. Um, maybe just connectivity. Get rid of this other stuff. Color. So this color, you can do a random um, color per attribute based off of the class. Looks like it's still, I think, I don't know if it's because these is right on the origin. Um, let me see what happens. So I'm going to get rid of this clip. I think that that might have been a misstep. Maybe just use the boolean. So we do a boolean. We'll just kind of replicate the clip setup. But instead of like doing it all in one, um, we can just do it with this boolean. We definitely want this one to be treated as a surface. And then we want the um, set A to be treated as a surface as well, so that it's hollow on the inside. So now you can see what I was trying to visualize with the connectivity and color, is that these are separate, separate meshes, separate connectivity and everything like that. I think with the boolean, it looks like the subtract is working, but you might want to switch it to the shatter just to be more precise. Romulus, how's it going? Seems like everybody's doing well. It's a bit busy. Busy vibes. Getting busy vibes right now from everybody. Um, so yeah, basically, we're booleaning just shatter or fracturing the shell of this sphere and then the weld now you can see it's creating uh, these little attached points so it just does that based off of um, the proximity constraint to closest point you could do max distance and, and stuff like that if you want to limit it um, And then I think if I increase maybe the pressure a bit and on the weld, I'm going to have to enable um, breaking. Whoa. <laughs> then you kind of get the idea of 
how you would do like a popping or fracturing balloon or something like that. Um, so you could do threshold and by default it does it based off of the stretch stiffness. You can see it might be easier to break certain ones before others. Um, and then there's other things that you could use as basically your breaking threshold. So I don't know, like stretch distance. Depending on what you're doing, some of these other ones might work better than uh, than others. So yeah. And then maybe with the grid, um, just do copy, transform. And uh, do rotations, and then a bunch of rotations. So now when we shatter, we get like a beach ball, some kind of uh, you sliced your watermelon this way. Maybe we want these weld points to be a bit stronger. It looks like there were like some unconnected points. There's some issues at the the seam. Um, so I don't know if I guess the clean is the best node to deal with that. Um, remove unused points, we'll get rid of those unconnected ones. Maybe consolidate. Actually, I, I think consolidate will mess up the, the welding process. I had a generic question with the burnout series. Let's say in a single take at some point, I want super slow motion what would you recommend? Yeah, we could do like a slow-mo kind of stream. Um, could be cool to do. Uh, but it basically depends on what you're simulating with like particles or RBD. You can just do um, the time blend and get, just sw switch this to speed and then you can adjust it um, as you need to. With smoke, um, I would work more like you would with a camera. So like I would film or simulate everything at like 240 frames per second, or I guess if you, the, the most that you need. So I would simulate at 400 or 600 frames per second, or just whatever the slowest you want to go is. And then, um, Play, play them back like you would more of it in a traditional video editing software. So um, that kind of way. Yeah, I would do it from the start. Um, you can animate like on DOP networks and everything like that. Um, you can animate the time scale, but in terms of like it can mess up the uh, it could eat up sim time if you're doing OpenCL simulations and stuff like that. It shouldn't be, be that big of a deal. So that's why I'm recommending it that way. Um, like you can cheat it with this time scale. Um, there's a really old, uh, somewhat old um, side effects series they did for a while back that was like called Off the Shelf. Um, with a volcano setup. I think this is a, yeah. So in this one, uh, at some point Scott Keating talks about changing that time scale setting. Um, 
So he's making a volcano here and he's basically saying in terms of modeling this and setting it up, if you work at um, a higher time scale and then slow it down at the end when you need to like actually see, like he's letting it simulate a lot faster than it needs to, to grow and uh, expand. And then, yeah, I, I can put this link in the, in the chat. It's a quite old um, Pyro workflow, so it might not look the same. This is like Houdini, this is from almost 10 years ago now. But just in terms of the workflow of, um, he's basically working in like a compressed time format for the start or the opening of the simulation and then ramping into slow motion portion so that he's kind of cheating. He doesn't need to simulate as many frames at the start to get to the part of the simulation that he's interested in, in rendering or visualizing. Um, the, but the reason why I'm not recommending this for most cases is like, especially if you're going to a slow motion of a burnout simulation or something like you can, um, you'll get different, uh, features like different, the, all the shaping nodes like disturbance and vortex confinement or turbulence might work a little bit differently in different time scales, even if everything is balanced the way that it should be just the nature of like grid based simulations and simulations in general, um, you'll get different results at different time scales. So you might run into a mess of like trying to tweak those kind of things. And then it's just easier to simulate more frames than you need with, with more, uh, sub steps in terms of like using your time efficiently, like you're using the computer's time inefficiently, but you have more time to work or whatever. Um, you can as well, this time blend node will support read timing volumes. Um, so if you have a velocity field from your volume, you can like readvect portions of the volume. Um, and that might get you close to, to where you need to be. But if you're going from 24 frames to 400 frames a second, that's maybe too much to push the time blend like you start to see some uh flickering artifacts or or uh stuff like that um i think um like when they added this uh volume retime node for Houdini. Um, the one guy, Ben Watts, did a tutorial or overview of it. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if there actually ended up being a tutorial for it. it Might have just been the results. Possibly Intagma did a tutorial. But basically like this new, he made this using the new Time blend retime method. So you can get some of that kind of like snapping uh, results. But I think even in this, he says like pulsing is really hard to avoid. So this is what I'm saying is like any cheats, sometimes relying on cheats too much, you'll just get into a situation where you're wasting days or weeks trying to fix artifacts from those cheats. So sometimes it's easier just from the start to say what I usually do, especially working with OpenCL is just, I'm going to simulate everything at four, 400 frames per second and then speed up areas that I, I want to. Demon Case, how's it going? Hope you've been well. We're doing a, getting into a little bit of like a balloon setup here. Um, still just playing around with vellum stuff. We were doing gluing sheets to a character, um, uh, for the first kind of hour of the stream or whatever, and just continuing starting to get into these weld vellum constraints. I'm doing all right. Yeah. I've been a bit busy, um, doing the Houdini battle tomorrow night, 6.30 Pacific time. 
Yasin TWC, how's it going? Salam Lar. Salam lar. <laughs> You're working a lot as well. Yeah, it seems I'm, I'm getting busy vibes from the chat. Everyone's seems to have their head down, buried in work right now. You'll be cheering in the chat. <laughs> Get these emotes. So I think the channel emotes, you can use these in any channel. So you even the Houdini battle, uh, their channel, you should be able to get them going. But yeah, and someone asked about will it be recorded? I believe um, they record like a quad split screen, like a first person shooter local <laughs> land play. Um, I think they record that kind of setup. And then as well, um, each individual uh, participant records their POV stream as well. So I think it gets recorded fairly well. But um, yeah, if you can attend it live, it should be. They have like commentators and all that stuff should be fun. Yeah, they'll record individual artists and I think the participants before have recorded their, their own uh, workflows as well. It's just better to record multiple on multiple ends just in case something goes wrong, I guess. So yeah, I'm just rotating those grids now to get uh, a less like just a more organic distribution. And we'll see what happens. They probably have a bit either weld Breaking threshold is too, too high. Vegan nuts, Megaplex. Yeah, he's, he's super good. Um, his characters are, are pretty cool. And then the other people, um, who's it? Nick Debonar, I think. And uh, I don't remember the, the fourth person, but yeah, it's a pretty heavy hitting lineup. I don't, <laughs> not really going in expecting to win. I'm just gonna try. Try my best. Yeah, they do the multi-view, multi-twitch view or whatever. Um, so yeah, we're doing, uh, looks like the weld constraints are too stiff. Um, the other option you can do is just like, keep, keep boosting the pressure. Looks like this weld strength is still too high. Knock it back. Still too high. This one's starting to pop. I'm thinking maybe the bend stress. Yeah, it seems like stretch stress is giving us a better result. You're gonna be restreaming the battle? Dave Stewart. Yeah, so it's going to be pretty, <laughs> this is the, the all-star lineup. Just, I, I, they've had a, I guess this whole, their whole uh, participants, like Peter Clays, he's an old school veteran. I think he's been using Houdini for six, like 15 or 16 years at this point. Jake, Jake Rice, another legend. Adam Schwab. Adam Schwab has really good courses on Learn Squared, like uh, really good like motion design kind of uh, looks and stuff like that. So yeah, you could see now really boosting this pressure um, and then switching back to stretch stress and reducing the threshold. We could try going like a bit higher. Maybe with the cloth. The rest length scale, if you decrease that after they after these pieces pop, like it's possible you can get them shrinking back down like they're bits of rubber. 
that's like already stretched to be into this shape kind of. So it's maybe a bit more like a balloon. You're saying each, uh, it's already kind of like stretched out and then it, as it, after it pops, it returns back into its smaller area. Um, the other thing, like after, you can see it's already, you can see the welds or the splits in certain areas. Um, so they have a special node for that. That's the vellum post process. And you can see at the top here, it has this apply welds. So this will look for weld constraints and then should possible. These ones are like already breaking. But you can see it's already doing some adjustments to the normals there. Possible my sphere is just a bit too low of a resolution. This post process is <clears throat> meant to um, analyze the welds and kind of like adjust the geometry so that it looks Un unbroken before the welds are uh, torn. So these areas right here are, it's kind of hard to see, but they're already like areas that are ripped apart, I believe. They're already like little pinholes kind of. But um, this is kind of hard to, to see. Maybe I need, uh, Just having normals on the geometry in the first place. Looks like for a sphere, maybe it doesn't matter as much. Um, but yeah, the other thing you can do is an attribute blur. Um, this is a bit more of like a, a hack or a cheat or something like that. Um, so I might have to do use before it. Um, but with this one, sometimes you can get like some, it looks like it's a bit harder with this. You could get some kind of like stretching type things with uh, I don't know. This stuff isn't doing what I want to. It looks pretty cool, but uh, it's not doing what I expected. <laughs> this is a bit of a conk. It's kind of a different kind of cloth where it's stretching like that. Um, I don't remember. It's like some alien stuff. <laughs> yeah, so with this blur workflow before, like what I've done, um, I've, I've used it to simulate that kind of tearing. Um, I guess you just do like a grid, um, maybe something close to 50. Um, so I'm making this grid 50, 55 units. Um, I'm going to use the ocean tools with it. Those default to the default ocean um, spectrum is a grid size of 50. So if you do something to get some waves, I'm just getting like an interesting noise pattern. Um, then you go back to the clip. So just deleting the peaks of the waves and then doing this blur. I think I need to turn off the pin. But yeah, you can see now it's kind of like stretching paper. 
or skin or something like that. So it might have been with my sphere. It's a pretty, pretty cool kind of organic carrying effect. Um, but yeah, I don't know with this sphere. It might have been that I just didn't have enough resolution. Or it could be because it's like already spherical to begin with. It's just shrinking it down too much. Super smart to use Ocean Evaluate. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's good. You kind of use this thing for more, more things than you think sometimes, maybe. Like doing this um, Ocean Evaluate, but maybe the amplitude are like a lot higher. Um, you kind of get like interesting bubbly. This could be like clouds or something like that. Um, you go down in the size. Um, and then even higher with this scale. This is like, looks kind of like popcorn kernels or something like that. Um, you could just recreate a lot of like natural based, um, somewhat natural based looks with it. I don't know. Some some of them aren't as promising as others, but for sure, I think you can get some some interesting like effects that you wouldn't think of with it. Even like weird curves and stuff like that. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not getting as much success with it for this. Like maybe doing volume preserving. There it is. I guess it's just like a later frame when they were already uh, a bit more torn up. So you can kind of fake like a bit of the breaking or the stretching with this blur. Maybe not even as much. This isn't part of the usual music. It might be, I think I just, I've added some. Yeah, I don't know how these got in there. I do see, I see what happened. It's, it isn't part of the usual music. I think it's from Chrono uh, Trigger, the Super Nintendo game. <laughs> this is beautiful. But uh, yeah. So it, it is kind of a hack because it's your like, changing the topology and doing a post-process, but sometimes if you're at, just after like a nice hero kind of frame, you might be able to uh, do this attribute blur stuff to get like, get some faces, like a Halloween pumpkin <laughs> or a ghost or something. Uh, but yeah, you can definitely like simulate some pulled rubber or like tearing flesh or, or stuff like that with it. Pretty cool. The music. <laughs> Get the harps out. So maybe these welds. Um, maybe just like less strength. I don't know. It's um, it's looking a bit. Maybe it's just too much of this pressure stuff. I think maybe also as well, starting off with a such a low uh, rest length scale for the base claw kind of threw things off as well, perhaps.
we know the different playlists. <laughs> so yeah, that is pretty amazing. You guys realized that even before I did, that it wasn't uh, in the typical playlist. I, I do need to go in and update my uh, default folder it's pretty soon. I think it, overall it gets a bit like repetitive. Brought you out of the zone. So yeah, you could do that. Um, another thing you can do instead of copying things like this. Um, sometimes I'll just do it this way. Point generate. So this is like how many copies you're going to make. Maybe just 21. And uh, then if you do copy to points, start with the single grid and then you're making this many copies, 21 copies. Um, and I can just pull this attribute randomize, copy it, bring it back over here. Um, so it's similar ways of working. Like this is making nine copies. I could set this to make nine copies. Um, but instead of relying on this um, rotation that just repeats for each copy, here you're able to explicitly do different randomized distributions or whatever. So the end results of these is quite the same. Like we're making the same amount of uh, geometry in both cases, but it just depends whether you prefer to control stuff using attributes or control stuff using um, the parameters. Let's take a look at some different stuff. So maybe, a, I don't know, maybe like a mixture. This one's pretty cool. So I'm just thinking sometimes like balloons, they have, they have more rubber at the top and bottom. Um, so they seem to uh, like burst. I don't know, the bursting motion like tends to look a bit different at the top and bottom because of that. Let's see what this gives us. I think my uh, pressure, I'm gonna turn that back to be a bit higher. Just to get more of that like expanding motion. So maybe just a very subtle um, with this blur. And then the fuse, like I said, this is kind of a hack, but like you adjust the snap distance. It's kind of messing up like the geometry because you're actually fusing or consolidating points, but just to get the, the different like looks can be a useful, bit of a useful trick. All right, so maybe switch this to a different shape. Maybe try a box. And uh, increase the divisions of it. Let's see what happens with it. Whoa. So my box was already sticking through the ground. That's why that was a bit weird at the start. 
So you still get a pretty interesting result. Um, the main reason I switched to the box was just to see what happened with these the weld points. Um, I think this will show it a bit better that like, do you see any progress on the tire burnout project? Unfortunately not for the, the time being. Um, I think I have it on the desktop. This is where we left off, I believe. Um, but yeah, I've just been a bit sidetracked with Vellum right now, uh, going through that stuff. Maybe this weekend, get back to it. <laughs> Need to, to finish it up. Um, yeah, the last stream we were just doing some lighting changes and uh, the wetness of the asphalt. Yeah, it's, it's improvements. Yeah, I need to get back to it. Yeah, with the slow-mo, it could be <clears throat> pretty cool. Um, additional camera angles and... Yeah, I think even one of the Vellum streams, we were doing a drape on this. Like, maybe doing some other shots. But yeah, it's on hold <laughs> for the time being. So yeah, the... Um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it's just a bit of a different workflow for the streams, like whether longer pro projects broken up into smaller chunks and, and stuff like that, or uh, these kind of standalone sessions, I, I feel like might be a bit more um, helpful or something like that. What a player. <laughs> what a player. Uh, the, the movie player is something called RV. Um, the Autodesk bought it. We have like a shotgun license or something like that. Um, you can do that. There is uh, alternatives on my resources page of the website that's uh, called Mr. Viewer. It's like a open source recreation or alternative of um, that movie player. But the RV is, is my go-to for right now, just because I know all the shortcuts and stuff like that. Um, so like if you go to the annotation tool, um, you can go in pretty quickly and like draw these. Uh, maybe my, my Wacom tablet got disconnected. You could go in and draw these notes, annotations and stuff like that. So sending screenshots to clients or making notes for yourself um, or just motion references and stuff is pretty useful in that sense. Just all, all kinds of hotkeys and stuff like that that I'm kind of stuck to, to, use to using. Vegan nuts. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, it's good to, good to hang out. So I think maybe it's the spatial blur. Um, Maybe subdivision. I'm just trying to think about getting rid of these. Uh, possible if you do another normal calculation after this weld. I don't know. But I've seen it get a, a little bit better results before. Selling your 2080 GTX, RTX 2080, and getting the 3080. Yeah, I was thinking about the 3080, like just in terms of a redshift, to have additional redshift render power. It seems like a, the best deal, the best price point, like um, best bang for your buck, the 3080, right? And then the 30, 3080 is like 600 or $700. And then the 3090 is like twice, twice that. So yeah, I don't know if it's maybe just my, the resolution of the geometry. But 
Maybe this spatial blur is doing the same thing of this blur that I'm doing anyways. I'm not sure. But yeah, I'm gonna go maybe a bit higher resolution. Let's see what happens. Yeah, with the new GPU, the only benchmarks I've seen are like gaming, like Minecraft benchmarks. But it, it'd be really interesting to see Redshift performances of the new ones against the uh, 2080. So yeah, this is just adding some more resolution of the mesh. Starting to get some some interesting patterns. <laughs> Renderman announced XPU version. I haven't, I, I didn't even read anything about that. That's like a GPU implementation. CPU plus GPU. So yeah, this is starting to get some pretty cool uh, results. And then I think as usual, like you could do an attribute to scale. Um, I, I always forget about this. I think Steve brought it up one, uh, one time I was like gonna build from scratch an attribute transfer to do it, but these scaling um, features are, are, should be pretty useful, I believe, as well. So like if you have a noise or you're painting on the mesh or something like that, um, you could have basically paint the area that you want things to, to, to uh, kind of explode in. Um, so take a look at the, maybe the visualization of stuff. Um, I could do like a sphere. Maybe this is, uh, I don't know, by maybe just create an attribute. Let's just call it weld um, strength and set it to one. The default will be zero. So now if I do an attribute transfer, this is kind of like the group transfer that we did for for this one. Um, but instead of a group that's either a zero or one, like it's either inside or outside of the group, this is nice attribute transfer because you can do like gradients or fall offs. Um, so look at the weld strength of the sphere and uh, just select that attribute weld strength by control middle mouse Click on it, should be able to visualize it. Um, I believe the default distance is just so high that it's, it was uniformly transferring it to one. Um, we just go lower. I don't know why the width is, uh, should be more of a blend. Someday do an explosion thingy. Yeah, I did. I, I haven't done any proper explosions, but um, when I re eventually I'll revisit some pyro stuff, and uh, I, yeah, I want to do some some more like traditional pyrotechnics style explosions. Steve, <laughs> you were summoned. Yeah, so I was just remembering you had mentioned these. Uh, 
ways here to scale by attribute. So I was gonna set up something to do. Um, I think I just need to initialize. So we have a weld strength here. Yeah, so after I initialize it here on the input geometry to zero, then I can uh, basically with this extra sphere, um, define like the, the area that I want to have strong um, welds and let's try something like that. So now when we're just control click here and uh, turn it off again. Um, yeah, so now this breaking, we can scale it by attribute. Um, looks like they're doing this break threshold scale. No concern for camel case for, for them. Uh, we'll just do weld strength. So we have that zero to one multiplier. We should see a difference in proximity of these uh, shapes. You might want to increase it even more and might just drop the resolution of the sphere down to work more quickly for right now. So I boost the threshold. still seems a bit uniform. It might be um, you just set this up with a color. It might just be that this is still not a big enough difference. You can as well um, just use the null node. So this this is what I usually do and bring up a spreadsheet. Um, so I want to look and find the Steve GH. Thank you for the three months Twitch Prime. Let's go. So uh, I'm just looking for the um, welds. I think what I can do is um, thought somewhere they have the output. Yeah, there it is. So I do output group. I don't know. Let me, let me go back to the spreadsheet. It's possible that the, these welds get set on the point attributes. Yeah. So you can see the break threshold. Whoop. The break threshold is showing up on the point attribute. So negative one, I'm guessing, is just a point that isn't a member of the weld constraints. But we should be able to uh, visualize it here. So it's, I'm trying to think if I want to augment these other parameters using the attribute. Um, what I might do is just decrease the stretch strength a little bit. Yeah. So now you can see that we, we, we do get a little bit of a ability to like art direct the strength. So any, anywhere close to this sphere will be harder to break the source 
uh, geometry or the source constraints in that area. It was pretty cool the just the amount of flexibility that you get with vellum um working procedurally like you stay in sops pretty much building constraints um painting or controlling things with attributes i i think the entire time today we haven't even had to go inside of the the area here but yeah sometimes i do just add this force to add a bit of turbulence to things so like going back to the first character setup, um, could turn this on. We want like these ribbons fluttering, fanning around a bit more with some uh, world space kind of turbulence. Could do maybe um, some directional course, like along the Z axis. Um, negative 10 like he's this is going to be blowing this way some more of him walking through a wind tunnel or something like that let's try uh 45 can you do inflated object that has strips attached it should be possible um I'm not sure how easy it is to couple like the constraints and stuff like that. Let's see what happens here. So it's pretty powerful, but yeah, it's just, he's struggling to uh, to get through his wind. Maybe I'll turn off the back face display. Um, so yeah, if we wanted to combine some of this stuff, right now we're, um, pinning these matching animation, do hair instead of strips. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of the, like how this stuff works I guess you just could try it let's, let's think so we'll just start with the inflated object again um, hair hair gen give it some some fuzz some peach fuzz And then uh, to group the, the root points, just doing the wrangle, um, group, root is, um, and set it to equals the, we're doing vertex, rim index. How's that for a, a mouthful? Um, so I think do zero at prim num, um, and btx num. I think I forgot one argument from that one. Let me just look it up real quick. So this is the way I was usually group, grouping the, loop, the uh, root points. So it looks like I don't need the prim num. And then I was just checking to see if that is zero or the first primitive number. And then we get the root points. So then these are the ones we're gonna attach. So on Twitter, I did a a um, just make sure this doesn't have anything. Um, all right. So 
so yeah, on Twitter somewhat recently, I did a note of this. Here it is. Um, I, I just forgot it off the top of my head. But yeah, this is a handy way to group roots or tips or certain portions of a line. Um, before doing this, I would do like a for each primitive and then group things doing like group by range. You can get the start point this way, I think, if you just do like one. But it was just a bit more unoptimized or whatever. So this is a bit quicker to run over lots of points. Um, all right. So this is the base cloth. And then this is the um, hair. So we should be able to do configure hair. So th yeah, this is the one thing I'm not sure about is how, how you would set up these pin constraints. So we, we have the root point group that we made. Um, I'm guessing like you'd have to do maybe a stop solver or something inside of here to keep moving them to um, to the source things. So the hair gen node is creating this skin prim, skin prim UV. Um, Those get used with the hair, uh, I think it was guide to form. So if we just take, before we do hair stuff to it, um, like the constraints, if we just take the curves and uh, the rest skin and guide to form, So this right now, just as a post process, should parent these lines to the balloon. Um, but it's just being done. The attribute interpolate. Yeah, so this is a basically a special attribute interpolate. Um, so it's using the same um, prim, prim UV attributes but uh, I think it does a bit better job with the basically knowing from root to tip like how to to, to reorient the uh, the hairs um, so I think I don't know but um, let's just make a group I think it might be a bit tricky with like constraints and stuff, we could try it. So this group, we'll just call this hair curves. Um, and then merge. Kieran, thank you. Thank you for the nomination. Yeah, I'm excited for, for the... <laughs> Decided to do battle. Um, yes, yeah, so it's tomorrow, like 6.30 or something, 6.30 Pacific time. Um, let me just see if, I don't know if there was, um, I was just checking to see if there's specific uh, node to merge constraints. But yeah, I, I appreciate you nominating me, Kieran. So just merge both of them like that. Um, and then inside of this, just make a 
top solver inside of that paste the guide to form um and i think there's one more thing we want to do so that would be to make a rest position on the skin with a balloon geometry we could even just do it to everything i guess just to just to have it um so what we want to do here i don't know if this is going to work but split separate the um hair curves and then this is going to be this skin um and then we do swap with rest and then the deforming position um this will basically be rest position skin sync <laughs> dyslexia skin um so now we have rest live so this should update the the hair curves um i don't know if like we probably only want to really do it to um the root points um I'm just trying to think what the best way is to do that. Maybe. And then pin. Yeah, I have the. Um... So I have them pinned to animation right now. Uh, the root points. I'm just trying to think. It's possible if I do this attribute copy. Um, what I can do with this is just update the position and just get them from uh, the root. So only the root um, position gets updated instead of the entire uh, length of the, the wires. Um, I don't know. Let's, <laughs> let's just play it and see what kind of mess we get into. I think I was missing I think in that SOP solver, I was missing something. I think I forgot to merge the skin back to, to everything else. Um, I'm also just going to bring the frequency of this down. Um, maybe. Maybe turn off the welds. For right now just to simplify stuff a bit um so inside of here i did forget to include the uh the shell for the skin back to everything maybe this is a little bit more straightforward. All right. Looks like the constraints are getting messed up. So I think animating, like changing the point order of all this stuff might be causing an issue um it's possible maybe doing this enumerate 
to store the order, maybe of the points. And then afterwards here, sorting everything by that index. Too many attributes here. Still seems to be an issue. Might I might just be messing around with these attributes and stuff too much. Um, let's see what happens. Let me just bypass this. You could always do it decoupled as like two different simulations. I'm trying to think. I'm not sure. My mind is, uh, <laughs> my mind ran out of juice. I think maybe this, this SOP solver might be an issue because it's like not, uh, operating on the constraints. Um, so like with this stop network, where did it go? Um, so the stop solver is only op operating on this geometry, but not the constraint geometry. Um, I don't know if that's just messing with the constraints inside of Vellum is a bit it's a bit top level uh, advanced workflow. Um, so yeah, I'm not too sure. I would say, f I don't know, without spending more time researching or experimenting this with this, um, I'm just gonna put this over. This, this will be, um, the challenge. If anyone can get this file and figure it out, they'll they'll be the commander, the Houdini in chief. Um, but yeah, so I'm just gonna do it with the decoupled method. Um, so if I was to do it. If I was in a pinch right now and the director, or the client needed it right away. Um, what I would do is make a cloth and cloth um, constraints with vellum. And then uh, just a vellum solver. I think we're good to go. Maybe turn on the ground plane. Just sitting on the ground. Um, we'll add our force, pop force inside of here to do like some a bit of turbulence. Might not be enough right now. Um, I think we want some more points as well. All right. So let's. By increasing that. I don't know if it's, I think starting with the grid right on the ground is causing it to uh, think it's like stuck. Could just be too heavy. Let's try sticking the wind. So I think to fight gravity, like you need it to be a bit higher in uh, in Y. Otherwise it was just that like gravity was continuously overpowering things. All right. So you have some kind of magic carpet happening. 
Um, just looking at that result, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we, we don't have any bend constraints. So just starting with the cloth. This one has bend built in. This one up here, I think I should have initialized it to cloth if I wanted the same, same result either way. But now it's a bit more of a better simulation. It's like before I was getting a bit too, uh, crump it was like crumpled paper or something. Um, so yeah, this would be the base skin or cloth simulation. And then after the fact, I would try this error. So this skin geometry would be what you want to use to generate the hair. Um, maybe just less density, longer. Get the roots here. And then this is setting up the hair with the animation. Um, then we can just do another vellum solver. And then I think we just need to set up the uh, the form parent to animation pretty much. So this is the rest skin. This is the deforming skin. I'll just give this one a play. So we have our shag carpet. Um, you should be able to whoop, be able to merge the two results. I'm just gonna get rid of the group collection set. You kind of have something working here. Um, Ideally, it'd be interesting to figure out how to do everything in one vellum solver. Um, I don't know if it's partly limited due to, I'm just working at the, using the simplified vellum solvers here. It's possible if you do a dot network, um, then you could have two separate vellum objects and have them in the same simulation, like feeding back together that way. Um, but I haven't done enough, enough, uh, research to, to figure this one out, but this would be my starting point if I was to research it, is to try out two different vellum objects, one cloth and one hair and build constraints that way. But for speed, like if you really need quick results, you technically aren't doing as much like interesting simulation stuff, you might want to uh, include the, the cloth in your collisions. So it isn't going through the cloth as much. But if I, if I was in a pinch, I would just do it uh, this way to couple both simulations. But yeah, hopefully it's helpful for people. Probably going to be it for today. A bit of a shorter stream. Um, but yeah, I'm still a bit busy with with uh, work and some other stuff. So we'll, we'll leave it here. Back tomorrow evening or Friday morning for maybe <laughs> certain people in other time zones. Um, I'll be back with the Lambo, <laughs> back with the battle, um, tomorrow. I am kind of procrastinating the Lambo stuff. Um, I've been meaning to spend some time on my end, like learning more about lighting for, for, uh, car paint shaders and stuff like that. So I want to do a bit more kind of like learning on my end before I press forward with the Lambo. 
Uh, but yeah, hopefully you guys are enjoying the, the Vellum experiments. Um, so yeah, we're doing a bit of welds today to do like uh, mid simulation breaking or fracturing uh, just for a balloon. But I think this weld stuff is pretty interesting, like for doing even destruction, um, doing like torn metal or that kind of like ripping of uh, plastics or any kind of like bendable, harder surface stuff with cloth would be a really cool um, thing to try to tackle. And then just fooling around with other gluing things. Um, I'm just going to get rid of this stuff. This was from the brush stream that we did a while back. So I, I don't want it to be super confusing. We already have enough things going on in this file. Um, yeah, possibly we'll get there with vellum. Um, plastic deformation, like the ultimate test with that kind of stuff is doing uh, a Coke can crush, trying to get the aluminum like stiffness and bending and plasticity of that material. Um, seems like that type of deformation is the most difficult to get with any end cloth or any like cloth solver or marvelous. It's, it's always like the holy grail of... Uh, Cloth solvers almost. So yeah, I'll just save this again. We'll just do, um, I'll just leave the name. Maybe do vellum glue to anim and welds. All right, yep, we'll be back tomorrow evening. Check the link. <laughs>